Okay, I think we're going to get started. Uh, thank you all for coming, and thanks for being patient trying to find seats. Uh, it's quite a turnout. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, my name is Gib Clark. I'm with the uh, Global Health Initiative here at the Woodrow Wilson Center, and we're thrilled to have you here this afternoon to discuss uh, reducing maternal mortality in developing countries. Uh, for those of you who are new to this center, I just a quick word about it. Um, the Wilson Center was formed uh, by an act of Congress in 1968 uh, as a dedication to the living memorial of President Wilson. As he was our only president uh, to have earned a PhD, uh, the idea was to bring together the worlds of ideas and the world of policy. Um, uh, the Global Health Initiative, the sponsor of this program, was formed at the Wilson Center in response to the fact that um, the 20 programs or so that are here at the center we're all involved in health in one way or another. Uh, so in addition to this clearinghouse role, uh, we also look at a, uh, several international health topics, including health's impact on development, the role of international and national institutions on health policy, infectious diseases, and emerging health technologies. Um, we are fortunate to have four experts here today for the discussion. Um, and we've had a couple of discussions recently here at the Wilson Center on, on similar topics. Uh, in October of 2006, we hosted a discussion of the Lancet um, uh, Maternal Survival Series, uh, which featured a couple of our speakers for today, uh, Wendy Graham and Julia Hussein. And earlier this January, we had another Lancet launch, um, this time on maternal and child undernutrition. Uh, today's session is the first time that impact will be shared publicly in, in North America, so we're excited to have uh, you guys here. And we look forward to hearing your uh, results and recommendations for maternal health programs. There are full bios available uh, in the handouts outside. If you didn't get them on your way in, please, please grab one on the way out. Uh, but quickly, uh, Wendy Graham is a professor of obstetric epidemiology at the University of Aberdeen in England. Uh, she is also the principal investigator for the impact study. Uh, next, Cynthia Stanton is assistant professor at uh, Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and is a uh, researcher on the impact assessment. Sophie Witter is a research fellow at the University of Aberdeen and a health economist for both impact and the IPACT, which is the consultancy wing of, of impact. And finally, Julia Hussein is a public health obstetrician and Senior Clinical Fellow with the University of Aberdeen. Um, as I said, more information is available on each of them in the bios outside. And um, before we get started, uh, you'll notice there's a camera in the background. Um, we are webcasting this event. Unfortunately, another project at the center beat us to the punch, so we're not webcasting it live. However, we will be uh, storing the video uh, alongside the presentation. So when we get to the Q&A, please wait for a microphone and uh, speak your name and affiliation into it so people online can hear you. Um, and before we get started with the presentations, I'd like to turn the floor over to Mary Ellen Stanton, who I assure you is no relation to Cynthia Stanton, and uh, she will provide another <coughs> introduction. So thank you all for coming. Thanks very much. On behalf of USAID, I just want to welcome you all here. It is wonderful to see this crowd of people who care about women's survival. Uh, USAID has been delighted to be part of the partnership with others, uh, Gates Foundation, DFID, UNFPA, WHO, and the European Commission supporting uh, this work. And I, I one other thing that I want to say is that Stuart Tyson will be our moderator uh, from uh, UK Department for International Development. He has been the moderator of this uh, donor partner group and uh, he has been very wise and uh, tremendously supportive and not only for this effort but for the effort and leadership that comes out of UK for promoting maternal survival. So um, he's well known, but also I don't think well enough known about the the work that he has done to promote this effort. Right, welcome everybody, and, and uh, thanks for that stunning introduction. I've rarely been described as wise. <laughs> Many. <laughs> Many things, but never wise. So I want a copy of this tape. Um, <clears throat> there is a copy. 
This is a hugely important day, I think. You know, Impact, the largest collection of researchers working on one of the great tragedies of international development mm. over the last 50 years, really, the failure to make any impact on maternal health. The level of deaths are the same as they were 20 years ago, uh, and despite the progress in many areas, AIDS, TB, malaria, child health, we have not made a dent at all in this. Indeed, we have had many, many false starts. One of my previous incarnations was working for UNICEF for six years, where I happily trained traditional birth attendants, invested large amounts of money in antenatal care, which did not make a squat of difference to maternal mortality rates. And I think one of the purposes of this, this consortium that came together six years ago to invest in what we saw as a really best bet best buy worthy of substantial investment was to try and build up the evidence base about what works, what doesn't work, how to influence policymakers in our own international organizations, uh, in governments, our partners overseas, to take this seriously and to do the right things at the right scale uh, in the countries that, that we work in. And today, we're going to hear uh, a very, very brief overview uh, of uh, the results, the, the work that's come out of me the past six years uh, and, and a direction I think I think for the future um, we have five presentations Wendy who's the lead researcher from from uh, impact in Aberdeen is going to set set the the context uh, Cindy is going to talk about unmet need for delivery Julia uh, will be talking about the supply side barriers and quality of care issues uh, Sophie will talk around the demand side and health systems related issues and we'll come back to Wendy to try and close the loop um, and identify where we go with this in the future. The last thing, and there'll be some time for discussion, but I will leap out of the door because I have to get a cab on the curb uh, at 10 to 5 um, to get to the airport. I was in a meeting last week in Kampala, the Global Health Workforce Alliance, which has come together to try and address another major, major crisis, which is the health workforce crisis facing 57, 58 countries, uh, developing countries around the world, mainly in Africa. And someone stood up in the audience and said, you know, why have we been so successful in addressing AIDS, TB, malaria over the last five years? A group of diseases that kill four and a half million people. We have generated massive amounts of money. There was $10 billion spent on AIDS last year, very substantial amounts on tuberculosis and uh, malaria through the Global Fund, through the President's Malaria Initiative, through PEPFAR, and, and a whole range of, of, of very substantial uh, and important initiatives. And yet today, we still see 7.5 million deaths every year related to pregnancy. More than half a million women die, 4 million, 4 million stillbirths? 3 million stillbirths, and 4 million newborn deaths. And that is one hell of a burden that we really are not making any impact on. And the only way we can make an impact is to ensure that we support the mother through pregnancy, we have a healthy mother that, that survives pregnancy and childbirth, delivers a healthy baby, uh, and starts on the road to decent health. So with that very, very long introduction, I'll pass over to Wendy, who is uh, much more concise than I am. So I hope you go. <laughs> That's a baton that I've been thrown. I shall try and pick it up. Uh, thank you very much indeed. And thank you all for coming this afternoon. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here and to present in this uh, wonderful setting. Uh, we chose the word impact for a reason, and it alludes, it relates partly to what uh, Stuart has just been mentioning. The real, we are all united by a desire to see change in the problem of maternal mortality, to see an impact in terms of many interventions. And we purposely chose that word, and it has lots of sort of ramifications in, in choosing such a word, including uh, the responsibility that we feel in having had this great privilege to undertake the work um, and, um, and now to, to report back on a snippet of what I sometimes describe as an onion. There's many, many layers to impact and some of them actually make you want to cry. And I mean that because of the complexity of the work but also because of the case stories and the, actual, the nature of the subject on which we are working on. So what I'm going to do to start off with is do a bit of scene setting and then pass on to my colleagues and as Stuart says, I'll, I'll come back. 
attack. And I guess, I mean, I think it's fair to say, you know, we are all united by this one rather graphic illustration. Um, uh, MDG5 off track, uh, as Stuart said, a uh, very, very minor, if anything, uh, evidence of a decline uh, between 1990 and 2015. And what this slide shows is the expected target to be reached by 2015. And all of you will have heard the saying that this one is off track, and it's clearly serious, ser seriously off track. Um, now, I, what we want to be able to talk about this afternoon is, is the sort of evidence um, uh, that, can co that comes out of research. And research has a, a role to play in catalyzing progress. I think sometimes there's some confusion about what that role actually is amongst researchers and indeed amongst other audiences. And I hope there is some time to talk about the contribution of research evidence more generally at, at the end. So what I'm going to give is, is a very sort of hitchhiker's guide to um, uh, impact. Um, I apologize for those. We've had a previous seminar uh, uh, over in the USAID offices, and that was focusing on the tools, the tools of the trade. We are not going to talk about tools this afternoon. Now we're talking about having applied those tools, what was the evidence that was generated? And there are materials who, for those of you who wish to hear more about the tools. So impact, it's... Yes, it's the Global Research Initiative uh, for Maternal Mortality Programme Assessment. Our goal is to improve the evidence base for decision makers on effective safe motherhood intervention strategies. The important words to emphasise here are evidence base. We are about evidence, and this is the age of evidence indeed. Decision makers, mostly we at the initiation of impact, thought we were going to be communicating primarily to policy makers and programme managers, and you'll see that's something I perhaps want to challenge amongst myself at the end of this talk. And we are focused on the level of interventions at the strategic level. This is not about evidence on single clinical interventions. And we all know there is never and there isn't a single intervention that is going to reduce maternal mortality on a population level. You need health system strengthening compre comprehensive interventions along the lines that Stuart mentioned. So this is about strategic investment, strategic decisions about major programs that will make a difference to reduce maternal mortality. In brief, we have worked to generate three main outputs, the methods and the tools that are necessary to evaluate interventions and show what's making a difference, the knowledge, using those tools to generate knowledge, to design and implement improved strategies, and capacity both to use the evidence and to carry on outcome evaluation, which is something that needs to carry on. You never do outcome evaluation is something that continues to be done as new strategies are developed. We have been working since September 2002 formally, although the first approach by the Gates Foundation and, and DFID and USID goes right back to the year 2000. So this has been quite a, a voyage. Um, we uh, will officially, uh, uh, as it were, begin to begin to closure sept in, in September of this year, but we have uh, views and, and, and recommendations on what should happen as a follow-on to impact. We have been funded by the three main partners, DFID, Gates, USAID, um, and with support also from EC, UNFPA, and WHO. This has been a collaborative initiative. We have not done this alone. Of course, you're seeing a very tiny fraction of the whole team, 250 of us at the maximum, based across seven research institutions in the north and indeed in the south. And the University of Aberdeen has the responsibility, and I have here our, our vice principal from the University of Aberdeen here in support of, in, in large way, indicating the seriousness with which the University of Aberdeen, which has been the coordinating centre, has taken on this role. Um, so, moving on, where have we worked? Well, we've worked intensively and, and, um, in, in three countries, Burkina Faso, Ghana, and Indonesia, and we've also worked collaboratively in six others. It's not the whole world, but it is a why it is a representation. And if you think of, for example, places like Indonesia, within Indonesia there are many, many different types of settings which present different challenges for maternal mortality reduction. We have sort of worked in two main phases. The first phase was run until August 2006, in which we developed tools to evaluate major strategies. We also synthesize existing evidence. It's very important that researchers, before they start to gather anything new, they are very clear on what's available and they make the best use of existing data. And what Cindy will speak to shows is an illustration in part of that. We uh, used our methods and tools to undertake major complex or comprehensive evaluations in Burkina Faso, Ghana and Indonesia, and as I said, six other collaborations, and we worked to strengthen capacity. 
We are now in the second phase of impact. Uh, we are uh, now in this phase of communicating and translating, and by translation I mean in a very specific sense the amplification and filtering of the multitude of units of evidence that we've generated. So this is, this is an example of that communication phase. Uh, uh, we are also... Oh, sorry, I do apologise. Um, we are carrying on the work on developing a particular area of, 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 of niche that we have developed, which is an, around specifically measuring levels and outcomes and, and aspects of maternal mortality and a website dedicated to that. And we've also developed a, te oh, a technical assistance arm. So we have button confusion here. Um, a, technical assistance, a technical assistance arm um, called IPACT, which is trying to uh, put back some of the technical skills that we have acquired and our colleagues have acquired in the process of conducting uh, impact. The tools, there are many of them, uh, fit for purpose. Sometimes we've used existing tools for measuring, uh, doing these evaluations, and sometimes we've developed our own. They are available in a toolkit. That's all I will say about those instruments, and I, I do encourage you to pick up a copy of the toolkit or, or indeed visit the website. The major evaluations that we're going to talk about oops, are in these three main focus countries. These were sub-national evaluations. We focused in on districts, major units, which were the planning unit, planning level for the delivery of major interventions. And the interventions that we looked at was in Ghana, we looked at the effects of the government's introduction of free delivery care, care being free at the point of service. In Indonesia, we looked at the effects of the Bidan Dadesa program, the village midwife program, where the government placed community mid midwives in the community, and we looked at the effects of that. And in Burkina Faso, we looked at a comprehensive skilled attendance initiative uh, implemented with the Ministry of Health, with Family Care International, and we were looking at the effectiveness of that. Now, having said that, um, as I said, let me use the onion analogy. There, uh, I'm going to talk mostly, and this afternoon, we're mostly going to be dealing with the outer layer of the onion of evidence. And rest assured, below the outer layer of the onion, there are many, many other layers which are made up of evidence. We can cite those, we'll give examples of them, but we are going to talk about what these evaluations mean in collective, collectively, what they mean for where Safe Mother is and how we might catalyse progress towards meeting MDG 5. So we're not going to go into specific details of any single intervention, a uh, single evaluation. Basically, um, in, in Ghana, we were using a before and after design, study design. Uh, in Indonesia, it was a time series, and in Burkina Faso, it's a quasi-experimental design, for those of you who like to hear the mechanics of the complex evaluations. It's not easy evaluating these, and, and, and um, not at all. Um, and as you're, some of you who were at the, the previous session, uh, it's very much a measurement fest. Anything that moves has to to be measured, um, which creates volumes of data, and then this issue of translating it into sensible units for decision makers is absolutely crucial. So uh, what we're going to cover this afternoon, as I said, a, a sort of a snapshot, but what we think brings out the high-level findings and the take-home messages, we hope, as, as our perspective is to it. Um, we're going to start off with Cindy Stanton, who's going to sort of partly sort of set a scene in terms of showing data on what the situation is globally in terms of coverage and unmet need. So this is about ex using large-scale data sets and getting some sense of where the picture is. We're then going to move into the two presentations that draw upon our own evaluation and we've purposely put these into two main groups, issues about the supply side and issues about the demand side. And that just about sums it up in terms of most of the strategies that you look at tend to focus on one or the other, often to the neglect of the other. And it's so crucial to get that de demand and supply side barriers being addressed in, in concert. And that's perhaps one of our other take-home messages. And then at the end, I, I will come back and, and talk about the whole sort of issue of translating this into uh, policy and practice and the challenges that presents. And what I hope will be a partnership with a much wider set of end users of our evidence, uh, in particular end users outside of the health sector. So thank you very much. I'll now pass on to Cindy Stanton, who will um, pick up on that first of the uh, sessions this afternoon. Thank you, Wendy. Thanks, everyone, for coming out. I've been asked to uh, speak today about unmet need for delivery care and also for emergency obstetric care and the gap that seems to be to exist between the two. Okay. I guess I can do this here. 
Okay, so very quickly, what I'm going to do is, first of all, just provide a very quick global snapshot of where we stand as far as overall delivery care with a medical profession, uh, a medical professional, and also global cesarean section rates with the idea that C-section rate is this very rough indicator of access to emergency obstetric care. I then want to take just a minute to show some new results from a secondary analysis that Wendy and Saifuddin, another colleague of ours at Hopkins and I have worked on, taking a look at uh, the relationship between maternal mortality and institutional death, and this is one of these uh, kind of large 20 country multinational secondary data analyses. It's one of the things um, I think Wendy alluded to in her introduction. What we've tried to do at the beginning um, in uh, impact is to always use existing data where possible, whether it's in our focus countries with the DHS or whatever, or use multiple um, data sets for these large secondary analysis uh, possibilities where they exist. So we've always tried to complement the intensive primary data collection with uh, secondary data analysis. And then last, I would like to go from the, the multinational analyses down to some uh, very specific um, results from Indonesia. Here we have, excuse me, um, the percent of live births with a medical professional at birth. Um, we have results from 1990 to 2000 showing the change between over the 1990s and then the most recent estimate that's available for 2000 to 2005. This is one of these big global <laughs> rough uh, uh, sets of results. I will say it's rough because there is a chance it's actually likely that the way MDG regions get categorized, they've changed a little bit over time, and so there may be differences in the exact number of countries um, over time in each one of these regions. But anyway, what did we see? Over the 1990s, we see that um, the percent of live births with a medically trained attendant increased impressively between 45 and 54 percent across the entire developing world, and we see the same pattern across all the regions with the section with the exception of Sub-Saharan Africa, where it was um, fairly stagnant over the 1990s, but there again, stagnant at 40%. What do we see as we move forward in time with the most recent estimate between 2000 and 2005? We see the overall rate for low and middle and come countries or developing countries at 61%. So they're again continuing to increase. And we see it across all of the regions, with this exception here in South Asia, from dropping from 41 to 37. I wouldn't guarantee that that's real. It's very possible that there's one, one or two countries different that got recategorized. But anyway, possible, whoops, excuse me, possibly not a lot of increase, but um, uh, not, not necessarily a decrease. So basically what we've seen is the percent of births with a medically trained attendant seems to be on the increase. Of course, as we all know, these, um, this access to care is not equally uh, distributed. This is data from 45 DHS countries, and they're put in order from the lowest to the highest rate of births uh, with delivery with a professional attendant. And what you see, the green line in the middle is the national rate, and then we have the quintiles. And basically what you can see is if you look across these whole this group of 45 countries, about two thirds of the country, for about two thirds of the country, the wealthiest women show rates of delivery with a professional attendant between 80 and 90 percent or higher, and the poorest are at 10, uh, t certainly 20 percent, and a lot of them are at 10 percent or lower. So extreme disparities between rich and poor. So those overall national rates may look very impressive, but they're not equally distributed um, within country. As far as cesarean section rates, these are cesarean section rates for, we were able to gather data for 90% of developing world births, and basically what we found was across the entire developing world, um, the rate was 12%, okay? So the WHO recommends 5 to 15, and this is 12% across the entire developing world. And if you look at the, me these are, the, we rounded up the data we could find, and the median year for these, reference year for these uh, estimates for these 82 different countries is 1996, so that's already quite old. If you make an exceedingly conservative set of assumptions about what has happened, and by that I mean for all the countries for which we don't have trend data, which is most of them, let's say nothing changed. That's exactly the way it was in, 19, as in the 1990s. And for the countries where we actually have trend data, let's say it's not continuing at the same rate of growth, it's only continuing at half. Both of those are are not very plausible assumptions. Even with those conservative assumptions, you take that up to 2005 and we're at about 16%. So across the developing world, we are already out of the 5 to 15% range. As you can see, those, there's really, um, 
extreme variation across regions with Sub-Saharan Africa at 3% and um, Latin America and East Asia, and this is particularly driven by China, um, at 26%. Here we have cesarean section um, DHS data for 42 countries um, in order from low to high. And basically what you can see is of these 42 countries, six of the countries have national rates at 1% or less. And 1% is that kind of magical minimum of all minimums that says if you can't get your C-section rate to 1%, you, are not e you cannot cover the absolute maternal indications with a C-section rate of, of less than 1%. So you're not even doing enough C-sections to keep women alive. Six of these countries, even at the national level, knowing that C-section is always higher in urban areas, et cetera, six of these countries at the national level do not make the 1% cutoff. However, if you look among the poorest women in these same countries, you see that of the 42 countries, 20 of the countries, um, those rates do not reach the minimum 1% rate, the rate that's needed to at least keep people, women alive um, in almost half of these countries. So there again, C-section overall on the increase in general, higher in a lot of places than we wish, but the distribution within and between countries is quite uh, extreme. I want to move on now to, from the global picture, well, it's still kind of global, this secondary analysis of numerous countries, but just... Is there a way to raise the picture? Because you can't see the lower Maybe. <laughs> Um, Chad, Niger, Burkina Faso, Mali, oh, the six countries overall, Chad, Madagascar, Niger, Ethiopia, Burkina Faso, Nepal, Nepal, okay, the usual suspects. <laughs> <laughs> okay, as far as the, um, one thing I wanted to add on this, um, you know, yes, these are big multi-country global secondary analyses, but they really, um, in some cases, they've really led to um, what we think are some important uh, policy effects. For example, this type of work which came out in The Lancet last year um, has led the group Countdown to 2015, which is this very influential group of the heads of state of 60 of the countries with the largest uh, burden of disease, to adopt C-section rate among the poorest quintile as one of the indicators that they should be monitoring in the future. So we're very pleased about that. Let's see. Okay. Okay. On to the next um, a bit of work. In 2004, Wendy and her colleagues in Aberdeen published a paper in The Lancet that showed a very strong and positive relationship between maternal death and poverty using DHS data. And we were talking about this before. Everybody kind of takes that for granted now. But in 2004, there weren't that many data out there to show this. So it was, it was an important paper. And the way they did this was to assume that poverty is familial. And by that, what they did was they assigned the wealth status of the respondent the DHS respondent to her sisters, assuming that poverty is familial. And they analyze maternal mortality and survival using by wealth quintiles using DHS sisterhood data. What we've done more recently, and this is uh, Saifuddin Ahmed, who's a colleague of ours at, at Hopkins, and Wendy and myself, was to say, well, what would happen if you extended that assumption? What would, you, what would happen if you, we, we wanted to explore the relationship between institutional delivery and maternal mortality. What would happen if you assumed that behavior as far as maternal health care was familial? And that is that what would happen if you assigned the, um, the status at delivery as far as institutional delivery or not of the respondent to her sisters and took a look at the DHS sisterhood data. And so that's what was done and we use meta-analysis techniques to pool D, uh, 20 DHS surveys um, for sample size purposes. And this is basically what we've got and it's a little, you have to think a little bit about this. Basically what we have here, these are the pooled adjusted rate ratios for maternal mortality rates. And the way you need to think about these is it's basically the rate of maternal death among sisters of the respondents who had maternal care relative to the rate of maternal death among sisters of respondents who didn't have maternal care because we're making this assumption that um, that behavior is familial. And what do we find? Well, we, we did two things. We looked at institutional delivery, but we also wanted to take a look at antenatal care. And it wasn't that we were out to prove that 
you know, there w was or wasn't a relationship between antenatal care and maternal mortality. I think that that was, you know, uh, mentioned at the beginning. I think that that's the answer to that question is known now. But we wanted to do it more or less as a confirmation to see whether or not the method was working. And basically what you can see is across, for the total, so across all 20 countries, or even when you look within Sub-Saharan Africa or within Asia, Latin America, and North America, um, none of the uh, rate ratios are significantly different than one for antenatal care, which is what we would expect to see. We also took a look at institutional delivery. And whether you're looking across all three countries or whether you're looking within Sub-Saharan Africa or within these other three age, uh, regions pooled, um, you see a protective effect, a significant protective effect, and a sizable effect for institutional delivery. So what does that mean? We've, we've, we've put it out there for debate. These, you know, um, I think one has to be very careful about the kind of conclusions one draws from these large uh, multinational DHS surveys, but um, we put it out there for the purposes of further debate. Another thing I'd like to do, and there again, this was secondary analysis, but this is an example where we did secondary analysis on Indonesian data. And some of it was done as um, very much a complementary um, exercise to address this whole question. Oh dear, three minutes, okay. To address this whole question of whether or not skilled attend, uh, the skilled attendant strategy reached the poor in Indonesia. What we did was took advantage of the fact that we have four DHS Indonesia surveys. So we pooled them all so that we had data over a 16-year period, which covered the period before the Bidandi Desa program started and goes up to 2002. And we wanted to uh, assess how successful the strategy was at reaching the poor and particularly see what happened around 1997 um, when they had their financial crisis, their economic crisis. Um, so here we have... These are trends over a 16-year period from 86 to 2002 in the rates of a professional attendance um, at delivery by wealth quintile. The dots are the observed uh, rates adjusted for the various other variables in the model, and the lines here are the predicted probabilities. And basically, from, well, even at the beginning of the program, what you see is there were very substantial differences by wealth in who used the skilled attendance, and that's not surprising. But what you see is in the top one, and certainly even the top two wealth quintiles, really over the 16-year period, you see high and con continued use of a skilled attendant. But where you really see the increases is amongst the bottom three. And particularly, the strongest rate of change is amongst the poorest women, increasing from about 10% in 86. Um, till, uh, to a little above uh, 30% um, in 2002. And there again, uh, the program went into effect in the late 1980s. It took a while to get into effect. And so by 1995, they say, 1995, 96, things were really up and rolling and those um, bidan were in place. And basically, you still see the increase. And even after the 1997 crisis, at, at a national level over a long period of time, it does look like Indonesia was successful in getting the skilled attendants um, to reach the poor. However, you don't see the same picture at all if you take a look at C-section. They're again thinking about C-section as um, an indicator of access to emergency care. And you see exceedingly low rates among, the, well, even the 60% the of the population, but certainly the, the lowest 40% with really no change at all and possibly even going down some, at least among uh, the middle group, where you do see the increases in C-section is amongst the wealthy. And they're again already up here at 8 to 10%. So... Yes, it does look like the strategy reached the poor as far as a skilled attendant is concerned, but as far as emergency obstetric care, um, clearly the poor did not benefit. Um, so let's, oh, there we go, okay. Um, last, last couple of slides, and there again, we've gone from a national long-term uh, look at Indonesia, now we're looking at the very focused, in-depth, detailed uh, primary data collection, which IMPACT did in two districts in Indonesia, Serang and Pandeglang. And this is a complicated slide, but I'll try and walk you through it. Basically, on this axis, we have the percent of deliveries with a health professional. We have, this is by quintiles, and the percent of deliveries by health professional is um, broken down by the type and the place, excuse me, not the type, but the the place of, of delivery. And so the blue represents in the use of a, a midwife at the woman's home. The green represents use of a midwife at the midwife's home. And basically, it's the same thing you saw at the national level. You see um, big differences by wealth, not very surprising. Um, and more use of midwives at home among the, wealth, uh, among the wealthiest. 
what this line is here is maternal mortality, and that's exceedingly high amongst the poor at about 700 per 100,000. However, even among the wealthiest, maternal mortality um, in these two districts was still above 200, which is really very high for the wealthy. If we take this one step further, there again, a bit of a complicated graph, but I think it has uh, some interesting results in it. Basically, what you have here is in the columns represent maternal mortality here, and the red columns represent maternal mortality among those with skilled att unskilled attendant, and that's for the poorest, the first two bars, and the green represent maternal mortality um, amongst those without a skilled attendant. And what you can see for every quintile is that the risk of death is much higher with those with a skilled attendant than without, but certainly the thing to really focus on is what's going on here amongst the poorest where the MMR is 2,300, and those are women who, who had a home birth with a skilled attendant. Um, what does it mean? Most likely it means that these women got there too late. It means that referral didn't work. It certainly complements, um, or rather the DHS analysis showing just no access to C-section amongst the poor. The thing, you know, the thing that can keep you alive um, has, has that nut has not yet been cracked. So I just want to, I'm sure my minutes are running out here, just to make a few concluding remarks. Just to summarize, basically what have we seen? We know the percentage of births with um, a medically trained attendant is going up pretty much around the world, but the minute you say that there are extreme differences between countries, there are the Ethiopias of the world at 6% and Bangladesh, et cetera, which are really low. But I think what's more important is the extreme variation that you find within countries, and that's even more extreme when it comes to C-section. There are a lot of people out there who are um, concerned about very high C-section rates, and I think the, the concern there, certainly there may be health concerns for the woman or the baby, but I, I think there are health system concerns about providing a lot of medically, non-medically indicated C-sections, but what has always been, I think, our greatest concern is the places where the C-section rate is so low, you're, you're not even hitting that 1% mark. Um, uh, just to summarize the Indonesia there, again, it does look like, if I want to look over a long period of time, national level, it does look like the, their strategy to reach the poor did work. The, the highest rates of increase were amongst the poor. They did not achieve the same levels as the wealthy, but the highest rates of increase, increase were amongst the poor, including after the 1997 um, financial crisis, which means, you know, their social safety net, et cetera, really did work. But there again, it's, uh, you know, the, the big push in Indonesia has always been on normal birth and on the bidan, et cetera, and there really looks like there needs to be more attention on um, the emergency obstetric care side. So with that, I'll... Good afternoon. This isn't a bad start, actually. I usually get uh, overwhelmed by the podium, but I managed to actually see over it today, so <laughs> it's good. Okay, good afternoon. Cindy has focused on issues of coverage and uptake, and what I'd like to do is continue on from that and look at the sort of care that women receive after they've come into contact with health providers and in health facilities. And I'll explain this title, Too Few, Too Unskilled, and Too Late, as I go through my presentation. Quality of care is clearly a complex concept, and this is just one of the many conceptual frameworks that attempts to capture the many dimensions of quality. And quality of care clearly encompasses both supply and demand factors, but I'm going to focus on some of the impact findings in relation to the supply factors, such as technical competence, training, referral, performance, and availability of care. Most of the data I'm going to show come from two of the impact evaluations, Ghana and Indonesia. And in Ghana, the evaluation measured the effects of a new policy of universal exemption from user fees for delivery care. This policy was intended to increase the utilization and access of health services, especially by the poorest, and the question it raised in terms of quality was if utilization increased and resulted in a higher workload in health facilities for providers, was this increase likely to affect the quality of care provided? And perhaps also more fundamentally, what is the quality of care being provided and is it of a level good enough to contribute to maternal and perinatal mortality reduction? In Indonesia, a policy of a midwife in every village has been pursued for over 20 years in an attempt to increase deliveries with health professionals. And the questions that were raised in terms of supply issues in our impact evaluation included whether there were enough midwives in the first instance, 
whether their training was sufficient, and finally, how were they performing when dealing with complications in the community. So these, in, within these two settings lay questions of availability, numbers and distribution, hence the concept of too few providers or services, the skills of the providers, and also another aspect important to delivery care, one of timing or delays, bringing up questions of whether care is being provided too late. I will focus mainly on the findings of the evaluation in my presentation, uh, but suffice it to say that a number of different methods were used to collect the information I'm about to present. A mix of qualitative and quantitative data was collected ranging from criterion-based scores to, access, um, to assess quality, questionnaire surveys for midwives, data from uh, National Statistics Office, and also a modification of the conf confidential inquiries technique, which are clinical panel-based assessments of care. Quality services cannot be provided if there are insufficient numbers of facilities or providers. And in Indonesia, we looked in detail at the distribution of providers in two districts of Serang and Pandeglang in West Java. The vision of the village-based midwife program was that each village in the country would have an assigned midwife who would live in and be part of the community she serves. The reality of the situation was somewhat different. And overall, for Serang and Pandeglang together, 61% of villagers, the last column here, had an assigned provider who worked solely in that village, while 29% of villagers shared their provider with one, um, with one other village and 10% shared with two or more other villagers. And these divided assignments were most common in remote villages, in villages very far. In fact, in this, in this case, remoteness was defined as more than 33 kilometers from the nearest hospital because of the, the median distance of uh, non-urban villages in Pandeglang. And if you compare the urban column with the remote villages, we found that 94% of villages in urban areas had their own assigned provider, while less than a quarter of villages in remote Pandeglang did so. And looking at the last row down here, in only 29% of villages overall was the assigned provider actually resident. And this was the case in a higher proportion of urban villages, 44%, than outside the urban areas, 24% in rural Serang, 29 in rural Pandeglang, and 31% in the most remote areas. This graph shows the proportion of villages in Serang and Pandeglang districts with no resident midwife, one or two resident midwives, and three or more resident midwives by urban, rural, and remote area. And over half of the urban villages had three or more resident midwives, compared to 3% or less in rural and remote villages. So indeed, in Indonesia, we found that too few midwives provide the resident care expected, especially in the remote areas furthest from health facilities. Let's turn to skills. One basic aspect of developing skills is training. And the training of village-based midwives has been previously studied in the history of the, in the long history of the village midwife uh, scheme. And the one-year midwife training program has been felt to be of questionable quality and inadequate duration. And as a consequence, competence-based in-service training courses developed. In 1996, the one-year pre-service training was replaced by a three-year specialist program open to high school graduates. Impact studies have shown that over 90% of village midwives had completed one-year training and 94% had received some form of in-service training for maternity care. A fairly large proportion had also received specialist life-saving skills training, although this was mainly non-clinical classroom-based teaching which took place over only 10 days. And in fact, only 6% of village midwives in our study area had completed the full three-year pre-service training. And it's not clear to what extent the in-service training can actually replace the three-year pre-service training, but given that it's been over 10 years since the three-year training was introduced, 6% is a rather lower figure than one would hope for in terms of training. Turning now to look at performance, we used a qualitative study where a panel of experts assessed the care provided by midwives when a complication occurred in the community. 
And overall, we found that although midwives' diagnostic skills were sufficient to identify urgent referral needs, their clinical skills were poor, with incorrect obstetric interventions performed in several cases and lack of confidence in giving obstetric first aid, such as uterine compression, emptying of the bladder, and simple administration of intravenous drugs like diazepam. In this case of a vaginal examination performed antenatally, despite this being a classic obstetric contraindication in cases of vaginal bleeding, because one could make bleeding worse in the case of a placenta previa, illustrates a dangerous intervention by an unskilled health professional. Let's turn now to Ghana, where we looked to identify if there were any changes in quality of care before and after the fee exemption policy. The hypothesis being that with fee exem exemption, higher utilization rates lead to a decrease in quality because of increasing and possibly unmanageable workloads. The graph shows quality assessment scores from 49 health centers disaggregated by region and by public and private health facilities. The quality assessment scores were computed from various criteria which included parameters relating to history taking, physical examination, first stage labor monitoring such as the use of the partograph, delivery care and immediate postpartum care. The maximum possible score in this study is 44 and the first thing that you can see from this graph is that the mean scores were way below this level for all groups. Despite the fact that we recorded some increases in utilization of facilities in both regions, in the central region, uh, sorry, in both regions, uh, central and Volta region, in the central region, public facilities quality scores did not change before or after the intervention, but in private facilities seemed to have improved after removal of delivery fees. And this might have been possibly a result of better regulation and monitoring as private facilities have to claim reimbursement based on the deliveries they've conducted. And so this may have actually in some way improved the record keeping that they had um, undergone. And in the Volta region, the corresponding quality of care may actually have gone down, although they, uh, and the change is statistically significant in public facilities, although increases in utilization were in fact smaller than in central region. But overall, in all facilities and in both regions, no change in quality was noted before and after the fee exemption. And this is in, in itself good news to show that there was absorptive capacity in the facilities um, to... Um, to, to undertake uh, increased uh, care without losing quality. Nevertheless, poor quality of care was very much reflected also in the qualitative studies assessing maternal deaths, with poor decision making and interventions possibly even contributing to death. And here are some excerpts from two cases of maternal death in women admitted early in labor and in good condition, where um, unorthodox use of, um, uh, of, of methods were used and no administration of syntocinone was given despite um, a bleeding. I'll just give you some time to read those slides. Okay. And although we did not look at provider attitudes in great depth and impact, it's perhaps just as well to acknowledge that it's well known in Ghana and many other places that the lack of skills extends to issues of communication and attitude with women scolded and slapped by providers and told to clean up after themselves during labor. So the overall impression in terms of provider performance, therefore in both Ghana and Indonesia, is generally one of poor quality and insufficient skills. So we come to the final question, is care being provided too late? Again, we found many examples of this. The converse side of a cesarean section being performed too hastily and uh, um, is, is unnecessary delays experienced in time between recognition of a complication and conduct of a potentially life-saving operation. We showed that it takes over 100 minutes and sometimes even 150 minutes for, um, um, for a cesarean section to be conducted when something less than 30 minutes might actually be considered acceptable in these situations. 
Our qualitative study uh, showed that partograms, uh, partographs uh, in only five out of 13 cases where labor had taken place were used. And given that these are supposed to be preventive tools to engender a watchful expectation expectancy over delivery events, their lack of use is telling in that action may be taken too late. Doctors in Ghana were uh, in fact only in, um, were seldom present when the women die. In fact, only in five out of 20 cases had a doctor attending despite being informed in the time leading up to and during the final critical events prior to death. And acute resuscitation efforts such as large vein access intubation or cardiac massage were poor and in many cases simply non-existent. And even after the woman dies, when it is too late to do anything except learn lessons for the future, maternal death audit forms, supposed to be a routine requirement in Ghana, were found in case notes, mostly entirely blank. And even in the one form out of 20 deaths we saw, this was filled out incompletely and unsatisfactorily in quality. Care indeed is being given too late, and here is a final example from Indonesia where an eight hour delay was experienced in obtaining blood for a woman who would otherwise have survived if a timely transfusion was available for her. So some reflections. Quality of care is a complex phenomena to measure, and that discourages good monitoring and assessment of quality. And many of the indicators we have in maternal health measure coverage, and that tends to drive the attention to strategies and interventions that improve utilization and access. But the goal of universal coverage will be a meaningless one if it does not place equal emphasis on good quality care. And the real challenge in measuring quality is to ensure that the process of measurement has two effects, to tell us what is happening, but also to instigate and catalyze change which emerges from the providers themselves. Thank you very much. Conscious of the fact that some of you are, are, are sitting in rather cramped conditions, we thought we might just take a few questions on the first two presentations to give you a bit of a chance to perhaps stretch a little bit before moving on to the last two. Questions for the first two presenters? Uh... Right, thank you. Uh, my name is Steve Harvey with University Research and uh, the Healthcare Improvement Project. My question, actually two questions for Julia, uh, one specific and one more general. Uh, the specific question is, you talked in Ghana in particular about uh, standards or criteria for determining quality and that there were many different criteria that went into the slide you showed about the low levels of quality of care you found in Ghana. Have you uh, developed any kind of uh, standard measures of quality that you would recommend applying to other places? Uh, and if so, where is there information available about that? I guess I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Okay, right. Shall I answer straight away? Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, great, okay. Uh, yes, thanks for asking that question. Um, I, I think there are two ways of answering. First of all, uh, for me, the most important thing in measuring quality is to look for quality care protocols and standards that already exist in many developing countries. And I think that is probably a good start to actually uh, determining what your criterion should be. Now, once you have found that, or if you find that they are available, what can be done is to actually use a couple of tools which have been um, created. One is the criterion-based clinical audit, and uh, I, Wendy has done uh, work on this, and it's a, a 
quantitative method which uh, lists a number of um, criteria, over a hundred or so, I think, if I'm they not mistaken. They can be mistaken. localized, but they're based on criteria, agreed, universally agreed standards of best practice. Sure, yeah. And I think the important thing is to uh, adapt the uh, locally acceptable standards and protocols to this uh, tool, which can, can then be applied to a certain situation. Now, there are, the, there are other, many other criterion uh, um, uh, uh, tools. The other one is the Skilled Attendance Index, which uh, we developed uh, as a precursor to impact in, in a SAFE project before. Again, this looks at the various uh, criteria of care. Um, Wendy's tool was related to complications, cases of complications. The Skilled Attendance Index was related to, uh, to criteria of care for normal delivery, um, as well as for complications, and there are two ways in which you can do them. So yes, uh, I, I think AMDD has also developed a similar um, uh, um, criteria in Based clinical audit. I think there are many tools available. Um, they, some of them are quantitative. Those are the ones that, that, that uh, I think uh, you might be looking for. I would also say that one of the difficult things about criteria is that once you start quantifying and trying to um, measure scores, uh, you lose on a number of things. You lose on things like over-medicalization of healthcare. You don't manage to capture some of those uh, nuances of what quality involves. And that is one of the reasons why we also went down the path of looking at quality, uh, qualitative assessments and, uh, and the use of uh, maternal death reviews and confidential inquiries in order to assess care. I think quality of care is complex enough to say that you actually need mixed methods in order to capture it properly because um, quantitative methods are only going to capture certain aspects. But those tools are actually available on the, on the web. You'll see reference to them in our toolkit as well. Thanks. Any other questions for this session? Can you talk into the mic? Thank you. I'm doing you Luwale from AED. Thanks for your presentations. Uh, just a quick question to Julia. Uh, monitoring of labor is quite critical to the quality of care that a woman receives. And I was surprised that you said only five out of 14 or 13 of the hospitals actually used pathograph. Is it because of non-availability of the tool or no skills for using them? And did you find pathograms in any of the hospitals? Quick answer to that, yes, the partograms were there in the case notes. They were empty and unfilled, or incomplete and unfilled. These were district hospitals. Uh, if you look at case notes from um, the regional hospitals, they are better completed. But it is shocking. That these, that, that there's no reason why our sample of cases should have been any different from what is available uh, in district hospitals in general. And uh, yes, we found the partograms. They were there, but they were not complete, or they were unfilled completely. So I'm afraid that is the situation. Okay, one more, and then we'll, we'll better move on. Just to follow on to hers, um, Maureen Lopina with La Leche League International. When you say partograph, are you referring to an electronic fetal monitor record, or are you referring to just a record of... Sorry, I, I'm referring to a, sh a sheet of paper which uh, has a line which tries to look at cervical dilatation, um, monitoring of heart rate, uh, blood pressure, etc. It's a simple piece of paper which is available widely, but just not used as much as it should be. Right. Can you hear me? Great. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to be addressing the question of uh, demand side barriers. And in a way, I almost feel like I can just sit down now because <laughs> the question is, why are people not using the services? Why are they not going in there? And I think Julia's presentation and some of those more grisly quotes um, make a very convincing case that these people are in fact acting very rationally by not turning up at health facilities for their delivery care. Okay, I'm going to be looking at, at um, demand side barriers under two, three themes. We're working in threes today and they all look rather negative, but hopefully there's some positive lessons to come out at the end. The first one, too far, is looking at distance. Oh, I've just seen it's misspelled, sorry. Um, <laughs> Or maybe there's a, no, never mind. <laughs> too costly, looking at costs, and too unfamiliar, which packages a whole load of um, different uh, cultural and, and, and gender barriers, really. 
So the first point to make about these is that, of course, these barriers and these different strands don't operate in isolation from one another, and they're commonly overlay and are interconnected, and that's uh, um, and often around the nexus of poverty, which we saw very clearly coming out of Cindy's presentation. So I'm going to be looking at these three themes and then moving on to the um, policy implications. And, of course, the policy implications for dealing with demand-side barriers are not just um, interventions that take place on the demand side itself, but it also needs to be addressed through how we organize services, so the supply side. This is a lovely little diagram with lots of blobs. Um, the point this one is really making is, is the way in which, um, firstly, there's a whole group of barriers which can be loosely grouped under the... Oh, I think I can point here. Wait a moment. Does that... Oh, no, that was the wrong one. Sorry. Um, which can be loosely grouped um, over here as relating to household factors. Um, and then there's a number of demand-side barriers which really relate more to the way that services are organised. And you can see that poor relationships with providers and low expectations of quality of care, which is what Julia has been discussing, comes down here as something which feeds into low demand for formal services um, but can be addressed through uh, the way that services are set up. Um, and which also links to demand for informal care uh, and personal preferences. And these, in turn, tend to uh, link with uh, low household income, and um, which, again, is connected to distance, and, and, and the distance and cost are particularly closely linked. And the fact that these are often connected around a nexus of poverty um, is, is illustrated. I think I really don't need to look at this slide because, in fact, Cindy covered it very well. But within all our focal countries, you see these dramatic um, inequalities between the quintiles in terms of um, skilled attendance. And that really illustrates the way these different barriers are knitted together um, and can be uh, interconnected around poverty. Right, distance, the first theme. Though these are just a snapshot of some of the findings from the different uh, impact studies which illustrate how important distance from facilities is. In Burkina Faso, for example, in the evaluation of the Skilled Care Initiative, you can see that there's a huge disparity between the households living close to health facilities, where 77% of births were um, attended or took place in facilities, compared to... Um, a very low level of 18% for those living more than 10 kilometres away. So distance matters. And this is something which came out also very strongly in an evaluation we undertook of a fee exemption scheme in Senegal, where the consensus, but this is based more on qualitative data, was that the urban poor would benefit significantly from it, but for the women out in the bush, it uh, offered no benefits at all because it's facility-based and access to facilities was so limited not just access to facilities, but also to skilled providers. And I think we've seen from the Indonesia data um, that there's limited coverage with the Bid and Adessa program. So only 29% of the villages had a midwife, and yet the presence of the midwife was associated with uh, higher skilled attendance and also, as we saw, with a lower risk of maternal mortality, particularly the villages with more than three midwives had half the risk um, of maternal mortality for the women living in those areas. Costs. Of course, a, number of, of, um, a lot of cost data was collected in the programs, and we can see that those are, are high, both for normal delivery and for cesarean section. And when you look at that in relation to um, household disposable income, we come out with a strong theme that for the poor, all maternal health care, even for normal deliveries, which are in absolute terms relatively inexpensive, can be uh, unaffordable. And I'll just give here the example from Burkina. The average cost of a normal delivery represented 43% of per capita income in the poorest households. And, of course, for cesarean sections, that proportion is even higher. So these are, are, are unaffordable or catastrophic costs, costs which will imply... Um, extreme coping mechanisms, sale of assets, etc. Again, I think this probably overlaps a bit with Cindy's, but what we're, what we're seeing here is the, um, the distribution between the different wealth quintiles really reflects the affordability and the cost barriers. 
But when we come to emergency care, it's not just the poorest who are facing difficulties. It's, in fact, can be the majority of the population. And, of course, these are also unpredictable costs which are harder to save for. So in Burkina, the median cost of um, a hospital uh, um, obstetric, emergency obstetric care, but this is without hospitalization, um, was $70, and that compares to a per capita income of $300. So this, even without hospitalization, that would present a challenge for all households, or for the average household, all but the rich households. And again, coming back to these big disparities which we were looking at earlier in relation to caesareans, what you notice is not only the enormous gap, particularly in Indonesia, but also the very low uh, levels in countries like Burkina, where it's 0.7%, as Cindy said, well below the level um, that you would need to address um, absolute emergencies. The results of the evaluations also reflected some learning about how official schemes were working to protect the poorest against these types of costs. Um, in Indonesia, which is one of the more organized programs, the social insurance program um, targeting the poor, Askeskin, um, we found that even with access to that, which in theory ensures that all poor people have coverage for both uh, um, normal deliveries with a midwife, but also hospital care. Um, they were still found that 20% of families had to borrow to pay for normal delivery costs and 46% for near misses. So a number of qualitative studies were conducted to look at why there was a low uptake of um, social insurance, particularly in relation to the village midwives, but also why so few of the families who arrived at the hospital had official registration. And of course, we find a quite a familiar range of barriers, including um, a lack of information, uh, concerns that if you're registered with a scheme, you'll get a lower quality of care, general mistrust, and also the stigma of poverty, the stigma of being registered as somebody who can't afford to pay for their own health care costs. And that's very familiar from studies elsewhere, including other areas of health. What this graph is showing you is really that although, sorry, thank you. Um, although I'm saying that the social insurance program is only partly effective, it is in fact providing quite an important um, uh, protection against the catastrophic costs. And this, this pen diagram shows you what families are paying with um, this line, the solid line is showing you the cost of uh, emergency uh, of, of hospital-based delivery care. But the line below it shows you what the families would have paid had they not been protected by the social insurance program. And of the families who actually presented themselves to the facility, 13% would have been driven into absolute poverty under this poverty line here had they not been protected by social insurance program. And this finding is all the more powerful when you realize that... Um, in fact, the, the people who are coming to facilities are not a representative sample because of these many barriers and the lack of registration and so on. If this, if this uh, sample had been